Hey everybody, welcome to Campus Comics Cast, coming to you from Carbondale, Illinois, with special guests from the Campus Comics crew, and now, here's your host, the man with the previews in hand, Mike No. Hello everyone and welcome again to yet another episode of Campus Comics Cast coming to you from inside Campus Comics here on Main Street in beautiful downtown Carbondale, Illinois. Uh, I am your host of sorts, Mike No, owner-operator here at Campus Comics, and joining me this evening are... Scott Reed, Dan Brown, Matt Martin. All right, well, this is the bonus episode where we don't talk about the previews, so... Good for you if you don't like the previous episodes. This is the one you want to hear, okay? So uh, we're going to talk about several different topics tonight. We're going to lead off. I'm going to do a little bit of self-promotion here, uh, just start off. But as of the beginning, as of early in 2019, uh, Campus Comics is a uh, an official CGC authorized dealer store. In other words, to get books graded um, and slabbed by... CGC, you can drop them off at the store. We will be happy to put those together, submit the forms, take care of all that for you. Also, uh, alongside with that, is if you have books that you're interested in having pressed and lightly cleaned, we don't do detailed cleaning or restor restoration. You know, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna disassemble your books and replace staples <laughs> or do anything right. like that. But you want to just do some light, dry cleaning Vacuum and vacuum it out for you. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> a little detailing. No pinstriping. No, no, not at all. But uh, just get get it pressed and then get it submitted for grading. Um, you know, just to protect your beloved valuables and, you know, help it retain the value that they have or increase the value of the book. Not that you're into that with comic books, but, you know, it is a side effect. So, I've, you know, so right now we're early in the stages of that. The learning curve still pretty high for me, but I'm, I'm learning the ins and outs of that. So hopefully we'll be able to take care of that. Just like I said before on, you know, other social media, you know, just one more step to becoming your full service comic shop here in Southern Illinois and beyond. So, and Scott uh, Reed of Berg Comics is here this evening too. And so he, you know, a lot of times we're going to take submissions at the local shows and at the conventions, you know, that we work. And, you know, even if I'm not there at the show, you know, maybe, uh, you know, Scott will be an agent of ours, you know, to be able to take submissions. If we can figure it out. We'll yeah, try to figure it out. We'll figure it out. <laughs> the other thing I have contacted CGC about, and I have not heard anything from them back, is I have asked them for um, information on how to become a facilitator uh, so that at local conventions I can, you know, be or you know somebody that i designate to be you know be there to uh, witness signatures, signatures. Mm -hmm. and everything so that you can have you know books signed and then we'll have the forms there on site again that is yet to come and hopefully we'll announce that soon but uh, but we can take care of that part of that that whole process for you as well so enough about me how about you guys <laughs> Uh, so the next topic we're going to talk about with everything done with that let's uh where we decide we were going to go after that talk about yeah, the dc, DC stuff, stuff. Yeah. yeah as uh earlier sad right, trombone sad trombone <laughs> yeah. as uh it's a sad trombone if you like buying your comics off a of walmart yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> right but anyway but i like buying and beat up out of a walmart rack. <laughs> i want to fight the kids for the Yu-Gi-Oh cards <laughs> Get your DC comics right in between the cigarettes and the Yu-Gi-Oh cards. <laughs> but um, uh, as we're recording this, it was what two, three weeks previous was the big uh, one of the big comics pro like conventions out in South Carolina. Late February, February twenty first. I think first is what's on the yeah. article. Okay. Yeah. So right at a couple of weeks ish. But um, comics pro for those that don't know is kind of a I don't know. It's kind of a loose like trade organization, you know, almost mm -hmm. like a trade union for comic shop owners. Comics PRO, which means professional retailers organization, um, and they have 
you know, meetings as they would to talk about things. And they have uh, representatives from publishers of all ilk, large and small, that, that show up, you know, many times Marvel blows it off. But DC is usually pretty good about having a representative there. And, you know, a lot of the small publishers do. So some of the most interesting stuff that came out of that this year and looking at a couple of guys that have a lot of the statements pulled up on their phone you know we're from dan didio or didio or however you say it of dc comics what's his actual title is it publisher he's publisher of dc comics yeah. okay so a lot he's of kind of he's kind of bounced around on what that is mm -hmm. for a bit now mm -hmm. we've had a lot we've had a lot of executive changes to mm -hmm. what jim lee's title is and what jeff john's title is and right who's in charge of mm -hmm. whom exactly right and who's who's the big man yeah so so anyway, uh, don't forget, does anybody got that, Scott? You want, you want, read you want me yeah. to read it? Okay, yeah, just so, go ahead and read. Okay, so uh, this is an article from Bleeding Cools, uh, bleedingcool.com's website, uh, published, posted by uh, Rich Johnston, February 21st. Just want to make sure we give full credit to the original author there. Dan DiDio, publisher of DC Comics, has taken the stump at Comics Pro, the comics retailer advocacy group, meeting uh, being held in Charlotte, North Carolina for the next few days. Not everyone made it in, canceled flights, bad weather, and the like, but they all turned out to hear what DiDio had to say. We may get a full report later. But the headline is that DC Comics is cutting the number of titles they sell through the direct market of comic stores. Bleeding Cool had heard rumors dubbed the New 22, and DiDio directly denied that number in his speech in Charlotte today. Uh, however, he did tell retailers that DC Comics would be cutting their publishing numbers back by a further 10 to 15 percent, as that's what he believes the market can bear. He also believes that uh, Diamond Comic Distributors are distributing too many comic books to comic stores right now, diluting sales for individual issues across the board. He didn't mention Marvel Comics, but I'm told that seemed implicit. <laughs> Bleeding Cool has previously noted, noted how different uh, creators have fiefdoms within DC Comics, and it seems that the deal feels the same, wanting a greater connective tissue between comic books at DC Comics and wanting creators to work well together, possibly more than they are right now. DiDio took full responsibility for the Batman Dam number three cancellation and resolicitation issue, saying he hadn't approved of the content artwork as it would be published, necessitating a further delay. What changes may have been made were not detailed. Uh, DiDio acknowledged unrest regarding the comics industry right now, but asked comic book retailers not to share their complaints about DC Comics or others with their customers, rather to hold themselves to a higher standard than the fans. <laughs> Uh, but he <laughs> voice emphasis placed by me, not by the article. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I think we all concur, though. <laughs> but, yeah. but, chuckle, chuckle. Yeah, but he stated that DC <laughs> Comics have better comic books than their rivals because they pay their power talent higher page rates than Marvel. I know there has been some disquiet about that as well of late. Looks like the deal is du doubling down. So what are their power talent? More as we hear it. And there's an update. Uh, there appears to be some spinning back. I'm told that Dan DiDio showed disquiet at how soon the story was reported. A retailer, Ryan Higgs, <laughs> tweeted, uh, being told... Uh, that the, story again, Dan DiDio doesn't know about Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> being told the Bleeding Cool article about uh, DC is mostly spin and speculation and some flat-out lies, with news aramas Chris Arant backing that up. Uh, this says his toast, or apparently his tweet was ditto. <laughs> Um, however, Heidi McDonald, who boasts of having operatives on the ground at Comics Pro and who writes a very informative piece about Nancy Spears being moved to VP uh, DC Sales, like other sides have heard that rumors that DC publisher Dan Dio was considered cutting the DC line to between 20 to 30 titles, a number that would send retailers reeling. Today at Comics Pro, Dio confirmed that DC would be cutting its line, though not to those levels, to focus on higher sales per title. I think a lot of retailers uh, through the market uh, has too many books, but they might be saying, not like this, not like this, which is pretty much in line with Bleeding Cool's original report earlier today. We will keep our ears open. Uh, there is more we need to line up. So, so anyway... So he's clarified since then as saying that the 10 to 15 percent that he was talking about cutting has already been cut from DC. He said that he was basically um, either he misspoke or, or he was misquoted <clears throat> that they have already cut 10 to 15 percent of their line. And honestly, I think he might be undershooting. DC's yeah. cut back a lot. Yeah, he they, says uh, there aren't going to be more cuts. Um, and then he clarified that they weren't talking about <clears throat> the overall number of different books because he wasn't counting miniseries in that. He was basically just talking about the number of issues you would be required to buy if you wanted to buy every one of DC's main, main books. Titles. So right. some of that cut has been made in the fact, and I'm sure everybody, this being a, a pretty heavily DC store, I'm sure a lot of people have noticed it. When they launched Rebirth, 
dang near everything was bi-weekly, right? Right, yeah. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. al- almost all of the the big hitter books, even the ones that hadn't really sold very well previously, mm-hmm. they were mm-hmm. like, everything's every two weeks. Um, and they slowly trimmed that back to where I think we're down to what, like, like Detective, four? Basically, maybe? Detective Batman, oh, Flash, yeah. and uh, Justice League? Yeah. yeah, or action. I, I think that's it. No, action, action, action and Superman. Ever since Mendes took over oh, the yeah. monthly, I think oh, okay. I think yeah. they did a biweekly the first month they were out, maybe, and then right. they went to monthly after that, and they may not have even done that. Yeah, I mean, I know um, the Man of Steel mini was like a weekly. Week, mini, yeah, that right. was a mini I thought series. they did. Mini, I thought they the, did um, two issues for the first. Well, month. Well, they might have done that, too. Yeah, but they they cut it. If they did, yeah. it wasn't it's more than that one month anymore. Yeah, no, yeah, they have been for them for a while. Yeah, I think they have four books. So I think what they're what he had tried to say was that. The cuts were in like you know you have fifty percent less Nightwing <laughs> yeah, <laughs> now yeah. than you have to so a lot of books got cut by basically sure. by half. Mm-hmm. So, but I think the other thing they're doing is you know they're ending you know we're down to what final two series of the New Age of Heroes mm-hmm. so those yeah. are gone, you know and I mean I think it's um, we did a episode of the podcast not too awful long ago where we were talking about what the industry needs to happen in the industry for sustainability of the industry. And that was one of the main things that we yeah. all brought up is cut the number of titles. It's just, it's as a retailer speaking from that perspective, it's hard to know what to order, yeah. you know, because yeah. if, if you're looking at, you know, at flash green lantern, you know, those quote unquote core books of DC, it's pretty easy to get a number on those a handle on those numbers, you know, but these weird things that are just cropping up all the time. It's, it's just hard. Yeah. You know what I mean? To know what to order. You don't want to not have them, yeah. but you don't want to over order well, it's them. It's also a different environment now, too, where social media plays a big part of this. You know, an mm-hmm. indie book can get a lot of hype online. Yep. Right. And, and then it just, you know, takes you by surprise when it comes out. Mm-hmm. And when both companies have a overarching meta story that is running across multiple years right. and covering by design every corner of the universe. I mean, mm-hmm. it used to be, I know when I worked here in the early to mid 2000s, that you could sort of group both companies into um, like sub lines, like families of books. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, somebody who bought Batman probably also almost assuredly bought Detective. And then probably two thirds of the people who bought Batman and Detective bought Gotham Knights and Nightwing and Batgirl. And they could probably be relied on to pick up the minis if the minis were good creative teams. But you knew that. Like you knew. So unless something happened, like when Jim Lee was on Batman, well, of course, that's going to blow up and it's not going to pull Detective with it. But you kind of knew where you were. And same thing on X-Men books, right? Like you mm-hmm. bought Uncanny, you probably bought Adjectiveless X-Men, and you probably bought Wolverine or <laughs> X-Factor or something too. And you can sort of group books together into those little niches and it's not really like that anymore Mm -hmm. because you know i mean when batman and flash have crossed over twice in two years not that i'm complaining because fun stories but at the same time like you couldn't have predicted that well all flash fans are going to be also batman fans now well no but they are Mm -hmm. for these two months that the Mm -hmm. books are crossing over so it's a little harder and, and you also like dan said with the social media there's so many creators on there that can promote whether it's true or not, that you need to pick this book up because it's going to tie into X events and what's going on in something that's more popular. And, and it's kind as of, good as Watchmen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's one of my favorite things Mike's mentioned. One of my favorite things is Donnie Cates has an ongoing, who writes Venom, has an ongoing gag that Venom is as good or better than Watchmen. He, every time he gets asked, and they did a variant cover that was a Watchmen variant, and I, I, my jaw just about hit the floor when I saw it. I was like, oh my God, I have to have that. <laughs> but it's a fantastic ongoing gag. Yeah, but it, but it, that does speak to the way digress. creators Absolutely. work on, on social media. You know, yeah. guerrilla marketing. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like it's to the point, you know, on our last episode, we, you know, we went through the previews, we looked mm-hmm. at the DC's book. I heard about that online on Twitter, not in the catalog. You right. Know, it was not the first time I heard of it. Yeah. So that's, you know, a big part of it now, too. Mm-hmm. And this is where things like the Dio denying things is also, you have to kind of wonder how much of that's calculated, because when, as Dan mentioned, that deceased was leaked to Bleeding Cool, and it was met with a denial that that, yeah. no, that's not what you think it is, which, oh yeah, that really hurts the story about the book, <laughs> oh, right? Yeah. Nothing makes people less interested than being told well, you've got the story wrong and there's more to be told. I mean, we'll look at their glut of cancellations they've done in right. recent months. Mm-hmm. Second coming. Right, you know, that's yeah. gonna yeah. go somewhere else. It's gonna yep. this mm-hmm. was gonna be end up gonna be good press for them because now mm-hmm. everybody's like, it's a book you can't have. Yep. 
You know, they did the same thing years ago with boys. Don't tell me that wasn't calculated. They just decided to do six issues and like, oh, we can't have this. As 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 a room full of people who were once teenage boys, I know nothing is better than being told your mom doesn't want oh, you absolutely. to have it. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I must have it now, and I don't even know if I want it, but I want it now. All right. <laughs> And then if you didn't get it when you were teenage boys, you can always come back in your 30s. And get it, you know? step brothers. <laughs> Even better. We got them when we're 40. <laughs> <laughs> right. my, my big takeaway from this story is like whenever I look at sales numbers, uh-huh. I often feel like DC is like outselling Marvel. A lot of times DC will have like four out of the five top book selling mm-hmm. books. And, and uh, so if DC is in a crunch, I can't see how Marvel is not in a yeah. bigger financial crunch well, than what DC Marvel is. Marvel has a corporate owner that isn't about to hit the skids. No, right. how it yeah. Is. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, like if, if you're, if you're Marvel, DC. if you're mm-hmm. Marvel and you're owned by Disney, and Disney owns, you know, the two biggest franchises and movies, mm-hmm. and basically Marvel Comics is a license to print money every time mm-hmm. you want to put a movie out, mm-hmm. it doesn't cost you much. To keep Marvel you know, right, operating right. as basically a giant petri dish for your uh-huh, movies. Yeah. I mean, the goal for Disney, I don't say this like as anything other than a Disney shareholder and Disney fan, <laughs> but the goal at Disney is ostensibly to let Marvel make as many freaking permutations of their characters and stories they can to give Disney a big buffet of, well, where would you like to go next? Because mm-hmm. I guarantee you somebody is looking at everything that hasn't been tapped Mm-hmm. so far in the MCU for where they're going to go after Endgame is done. They have to have a new meta story for all those movies and mm-hmm. Marvel has given them a wealth of those. Meanwhile, at DC, Warner Brothers can't figure out how to make mm-hmm. a half-competent movie half the time, yeah, right? Mm-hmm. That, was, three the quarters thing, that the was the thing that was Warner Brothers for so long was right. DC yep. didn't have to make a profit right. because they knew long term. Well, and, and for a long Warner time, Brothers. DC bragged yeah. that they had, a, they had vertical integration of, well, yeah. our movies are made by the same people that own our comics. So, right. And, you know, when I used to work here, I used to say, I don't understand how the people, the company that, that made Batman the Animated Series and Superman the Animated Series and Justice League the cartoon, which were such amazing perfect boiled down to the essentials versions of all those characters if you knew anything at all about any of the dc characters you could watch those cartoons and go oh yeah that's exactly what i thought it would be i don't know how those people couldn't you know find their own butt with two hands and a map towards (laughs) making a a, a decent movie half the time but they couldn't and you're you're giving up like all the competitive advantage you had over marvel yeah and now marvel has all that pulled together they could have had a movie universe in the 80s and the 90s you know what i mean there was nothing keeping them from doing that. Yeah. First. And, you know, I mean, like, look, I love the Nolan verse, um, mm-hmm. but it's not a superhero movie. No. They're just yeah. really good movies, movies yeah. except for Dark Knight Rises, like, yeah. where Batman Brown, spends yeah. an hour in a hole. Um, but, to, you know, <laughs> too two much of, sunlight. Two of them are great, but they're not great Batman movies. They're just great movies that happen to star Batman, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, if you look at, uh, if, if you would have told me that Marvel was going to make Ant Man, a huge success. So, yeah. I'd have been like, well, I hope so. But that <laughs> feels Guardian, optimistic. Guardians yeah. of the Galaxy. Well, Guardians, yeah. I felt Guardian, pretty good about Guardian honestly. That was when I... That was kind of the tipping point for me. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm if like, okay, this, what's going to bomb? What's it going to be? What's the first but it's one? Not, it's not just that and we like them. Yeah. It's that people who aren't us like them. Yeah. Uh-huh. If you yeah. told somebody, mm-hmm. it's sure. about a it's about a guy with a helmet that lets him shrink and talk to ants. Right. And you'd been like, yeah, you that's going to make a lot of money. Yeah. But then again, who'd have thought that, uh, you know, he talks to fish and uh, and uh-huh. twirls a baton was going to make a billion dollars. <laughs> but here we are. I was like, uh, whenever people talk about Ant-Man, it's like back in the I don't know, late 70s, early 80s, one of the times that Marvel got sold early on and they, yeah. s- they sold for like a small amount of money which if you're and new to comics isn't that wild yeah, to imagine yeah. how hard marvel had it for so yeah long. and and like jack kirby at the time was like i got basic quote is saying like i don't know like maybe marvel sold at the time for like two million dollars or something like that and he was like ant-man is worth more than two million dollars mm-hmm. and he was right mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. you know, and people were like oh crazy jack kirby yeah, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. but what, what other points are we, are we on with the with the stuff i mean there is the takeaway the stuff that me because of the business mm-hmm. I'm in was griping about the whole Walmart situation. Right. What? You know, the, I know, right? <laughs> but uh, well, yes, I guess there I'm was just, some misinformation there. Yeah, there was initially, right? So. Yeah, initially. So, I mean, I guess I'm turning to the cranky old man of the comic book set. I don't know, but it's just like, <laughs> you know. But no, I mean, it's just like it's just aggravating because of what happened in the '80s and comic books being pulled out of Walmart, which ended up with Paul, right. comic books being pulled out of all mass market, right. essentially. So then, who carries the torch for 30 years? You know, would be the local retailers, like what mm-hmm. Campus Comics is, 
and others, and then just to feel like by one of the major publishers, you're kind of getting thrown under the bus by these books, you know, that you can't even carry and that, you know, collectors are going to want. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in essence, it's fine if you have reprint books, you know, in Walmart and people pick them up, say, hey, we're going to get more of it, this kind of stuff, and they find you. But whenever they're, they're putting these original stories, well, this is all water under the bridge now because... You know, that was my, my sore point with that was the exclusive content that were in these books by major talents like mm -hmm. a Tom King Superman story, a Bendis Batman story. Mm -hmm. First appearance of characters like Jenny Hex, which was, you know, Jonah Hex's granddaughter, great yeah, granddaughter, great granddaughter like whatever like that. In a Walmart exclusive books after we've towed the line, mm -hmm. you know, for 30 years. And so now, you know, initially they were saying those books in Walmart were coming to an end. So... Now they that came back out and was reclarified, which is what Scott was just talking about. That those books will continue, but they're not the going to be Walmart is coming exclusive. To yeah. We will be able to have those in the store. And it, it sounded from the way that I the story I read that they that the exclusivity for all the ongoing and the previous. Mm -hmm. Maybe so come can, to an end, as in they may sell those books to the direct market, like Superman Giant number one. Because you see those guys, those are handled by, you know, not by Walmart. There are yeah, vendors, vendors that go out and collect those. Yeah. So they've taken the books that haven't sold after a certain amount of time. They pulled those off the shelf. I'm sure they've gone back to Diamond. So maybe they'll make those previous issues that haven't sold out or whatever, you know, that available to retailers. And if you so. want to know what uh, the industry in the 80s was like when Mike's talking about how, you know, the publishing industry basically came to the direct market with their hat in their hands and essentially created the direct market, um, if you have been in the shop and looked at the racks that the comics are on, these are the same racks that have been here when we were on the strip. They're the same racks that Dennis had when I started coming here in the 90s. I learned when I worked for Dennis that these are racks that were given to him by Diamond. Mm -hmm. Diamond shipped them to the store. They gave retailers display racks because they needed retailers that badly. They wanted to give you so much that they need your business that they will give you the proper display space for the comics. So, and, and if you need to know how nice they are, I mean, they've been here since, you know, like the <laughs> mid eighties, right, Dennis yeah. opened the store in 83 <laughs> and he uh, didn't get the racks very long after he opened. As I recall, these are the same comic racks that were here when I was coming here, started coming in 1992. Uh, so it was my favorite thing when I started working for him was like, are these the same racks? Yes, they are. Uh -huh. So they're, they're well-made like diamond gave, yeah. racks that held up for 30 something years to people because they needed the business and now they're like oh yeah you guys are great but walmart's coming so uh so, peace sleep. it's like it was like it was fun to hang out the geek table at the lunchroom until the cool kids wanted me back and now i'm going <laughs> back over there with the cheerleaders <laughs> uh, I, there's i don't know if this is i kind of feel like this is relevant but part mm -hmm. of that discussion all these about all this talk about the comic retailers like this number that keeps getting thrown around about how many comic retail shops are actually mm -hmm. left in the united states mm -hmm. and the number i keep hearing is like 1500 are Bleed, you guys hearing bleeding that cool, number bleeding cool runs stories every week on the shops that close and the shops that open and it's generally about three to one in favor of shops closing mm -hmm. and shops opening okay. at, at, at least mm -hmm. i can't imagine I, I would be interested to know that you know because you know obviously I've only owned the store here for two and a half years. You know what I mean? But Dennis McCord, who we were going to have on an episode of the Campus Comics cast at some point, because I want to talk to him and interview him about what was it like to run a coffee shop in the 90s? Because it was a time that almost killed the industry, but he was making hand money it's a, hands it's, over It's a time fist. that there was enough money to be made that Dennis owned two stores in this area at yeah. the time. He had the other shop. I remember when he said, back in the day, I'd take him to the other store, and I said, what other store? And I, didn't, I didn't yeah. remember that. I was buying comics for him at the time. I was in that shop a few times. So, uh -huh. so, so that, that'd be an interesting story to hear, but... Um, where was I going? I got about the, how few there are. How few, shops. Oh, how few there are. Yeah. How I mean, how many store comic shop retailers do you think there are? You know, if there's only 1,500, how many have been around for 35 years? Yeah. Like this yeah. store. It's also just strange that if you look on Comic Shop Locator, the, it's like, you know, they, they, people talk about um, in politics, they talk about food deserts, that there are places where, like, if you live in the city and you can't afford to leave the city, you don't have easy access to, like, fresh produce and stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're eating convenience store food, right? There's like comic deserts. If you look at the comics locator, oh, yeah. there are there are bubbles, right? So we have three comic shops inside of ten miles in Carbondale, mm -hmm. and then to find the nearest one, you got to drive, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But then you get to somewhere like I'm in O'Fallon every day for work, and I think there are three shops in O'Fallon, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then you get to St. Louis, and then there's another. But but like mm -hmm. in between us and O'Fallon, 
Uh, like there's not one in Nashville or Pinkneyville no, or something yeah, like right. that. So if you're a kid in Nashville, and I think about this all the time when I'm driving through and I pass Nashville High School, I think, what do you do if you're in Nashville and you're like a kid who wants to read comics? You got to get somebody to truck you down mm -hmm. the interstate, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, 35 miles to, to O'Fallon when or I come was, all the way down to Carbondale. Yeah, when I was 14, 15, my poor mother got in a car once a month mm -hmm. and drove me to Carbondale. It's 50 miles so I could mm -hmm. go pick up my comic books. My mom worked at SIU and she picked my books up there. For me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dennis knew my mama more than he knew me a lot of the time. I only came in on Saturdays, but Mrs. Martin came in once a week. <laughs> uh, yeah, years ago I was looking into a job in another town, and uh, one of the things I thought of was like, is there a comic shop in that town? <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. I don't think there is. <laughs> I don't I want mean, that job. At, 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 at this I'm point, not, and I want to clarify that I'm not taking credit for this store being around 35 years. I'm I'm yeah. responsible for two and a half. You're responsible for the next 35. Right? Yeah. There you go. We're going to do that. This is where we reveal like, Mike's true history. That's right. As the mastermind behind the store since '83. The big tagger on. <laughs> I told Dennis, or whenever I, that we had the the event here at the store. You know, it was Dennis's 66th birthday. You know, that day it was the day I took over the store, and it's just like I said that then. I'll say it again now. It's just like I don't believe I can start. I could start this store if I had to, but I'm pretty sure I can carry it on. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> pretty so sure I'm you very, can run it into the ground. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I can drag this all inside of the garage. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it is right. to the point when to, to to piggyback off what Dan said about moving. Anytime I've ever considered moving, I have a pretty long commute for work, and my wife and I periodically talk about moving, and I think I would either drag my butt all the way back to Carbondale, or I'd just go mail order, because I don't have time <laughs> to learn a new cast of characters in a new comic book store. I don't have to learn to teach people to tolerate how loud I am and how I curse way too much. And who's got time for it? I'm almost 40. It'd take too long. I've been coming here since 92. It isn't going to happen. The other point that I just... We all kind of chuckled as Scott was reading. Is like, so the Dio statements there about yeah. just like, um, you know, we know that there's some problems here in the industry. But keep your mouth but shut. But keep your nerds. mouth shut. Yeah. You know, be bigger than that. It's like, Ugh. no, don't tell me how to run my business. How, number how about one. you be bigger than that? Yeah. Listen to and don't do this stuff that makes us feel this way. Mm -hmm. If you, you know? want the respect of the comic book retailers, respect your comic retailers. Exactly. But I will say, uh, for ragging on the Dio, and he definitely earns it. Um, it is it is nice that he shows up at Comics Pro because the people who show up at Comics Pro um, they know they're opening they themselves. They get up. an earful. Uh huh. And you're basically signing up to be an unpaid punching bag in, in some markets. Sometimes you show up and you are like, you know, the fetid hero. People mm -hmm. like, we're, you know, putting the, the garlands around your neck and the laurels on your head. And sometimes they're ready with the pitchforks and the torches and chucking tomatoes at you. And this was definitely a tomato chucking one because um, the, every report is that he got an earful from mm -hmm. the, retailers, the retailers. So, But, you know, I mean, there's always that. But, I mean, we've said it in previous podcasts, too. You know, it's just like... We say these things and we can feel these things, and he can ask us to keep it, you know, to, to be bigger than that and all that thing. But DC does tend to be a little bit more responsive when they hear these things and these complaints than other than, uh, you know, than some other publishers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just like, you don't care. You'll take it and you'll like it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's kind of the attitude from others, you know. But DC does periodically offer some returnability, mm -hmm. you know, and, and things like that, which are which yeah i mean they're listening they showed up there they listened to what we had to say yeah, i mean you can reorder books from them yes you know they could have changed that policy mm -hmm. you know yep. they haven't yep well, they keep inventory on most well, of their like, stuff like you said we said earlier they're pulling the exclusivity of those yeah. books they're you know the issue with the dc previews being limited to one mm -hmm. per previews i mean they they answered that. that so i mean they, they're, yeah they're the reason that stuff. you uh, if you look at the ship list every week the reason that you see uh, second printings from Marvel and Image much more commonly than you from DC is because DC prints a mm -hmm. generous overprinting on most things. Yeah. So right. it's not it's not reflective of one company selling better than the other. It's that Marvel cuts their order their mm -hmm. printing orders very close to the bone and mm -hmm. then reprints when necessary. Right. It's probably more efficient to do it Marvel's way. And obviously. they can sell the DC variants. is yeah. 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 It's probably more <laughs> profitable can, for yeah. them too. Yeah. 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 But DC is DC is do, taking a, a bit more of a retailer friendly approach because you got to wait for those second printings to come out and sometimes by the time you get a second printing the heat's off the book and you, you end up with some mm -hmm. unsold copies um so you can usually I mean, typically you can get a turnaround about a week on dc oh right? yeah get it right yeah, back for in. sure mm -hmm. yeah so that is helpful. i can actually if i i can look at my ship list and i usually do like on saturday or monday 
and it's just like if oh I need a couple more copies to cover everybody that wants that I can usually put it on the reorder and have them that week you know so really the, re the turnaround on that is you know they usually have their books in the dis you know into the reorder distribution warehouse in time to get them out to the books out to the shops in time for that week yeah. there was a day when I was first working for Dennis when Marvel was overprinting nothing mm -hmm. and if we had damaged books or if Diamond just brain farted and didn't put something in there mm -hmm. I mean in some cases we would just not get it uh -huh. and Dennis had me on eBay hunting books down from other retailers asking for wholesale prices to stock stuff because the answer was just a guffaw from Diamond yeah. if you tried to reorder a Marvel mm -hmm. book like oh that's cute that you think you can <laughs> but, but no no small child you can't have these I, I, this is I'm related but unrelated to what we're talking about, but I just I just recently became aware of this website. It's it's comiccron.com, C O M I C H R O N. Yeah, and they have like all the sale, sales numbers for comics going back to like 1995. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's don't like, you wish they had them back to the a little, little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could yeah. see those six million, million copies dollars, of yeah. X Men and mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, but um, but it's like when we look at like I got the December numbers pulled up right now. Okay, and of the December numbers, like there's okay so. Uh, Batman Who Last was number one that month, 220,000 copies. Okay, Batman Dam was number two, 138,000 copies. Uh, Doomsday Clock uh, was number three, 123,000 copies. Those are the only books in December that sold over 100,000 copies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And then the next two books are Batman, <laughs> Batman issues 60 and 61. They're in the 90,000 range, actually 91 and 88. And finally, at number six, you hit your first Marvel book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you go so, to the top five, all DC. But yeah. if you but if you look, if you expand that out to the top fifty, mm -hmm. and Marvel eats DC's lunch. Well, yeah. So DC typically takes the very very top. Mm -hmm. Marvel takes the second half of the top ten, and then they usually take like eight out of the next ten, and it kind of gets out of hand. Now DC and Marvel, if you go to the top one hundred, tend to kind of even out. It's about. 45 45 generally mm -hmm. there'll be a handful of images but marvel will marvel will have a big long stretch because then you get into like there's amazing and there's star wars yeah. and there's these big properties that have a movie dc dc has a really high high and then they have a really acceptable low but marvel has either you know what i mean like marvel has a big group around they're they're higher than dc's low range but marvel's bottom is also like in the can so if you look at like marvel miniseries mm -hmm. don't sell like a dc right. miniseries and there's a reason for that but marvel's average book marvel also just makes more money off their books too yeah frankly so i guess because um, they're paying the lower page rates that as the no just with... charge more per book oh okay mm -hmm. well, yeah. yep that too. DC typically ships more units. Marvel makes more money, but they're kind of neck and neck. Um, if someone's going to win both, it's almost always Marvel. But Marvel mm -hmm. usually, if they win on units, they squeak a win out on units. But they usually fairly healthily beat them on dollars. It's usually about about five percent. Really? Okay. Yeah. But if you look back to '95, I don't know what the numbers will look like then, but I know that almost every book on the shelves right now would have been would have been canceled oh, in, oh, in, sure. in the early '90s. <laughs> yeah. And it's also just scary to think if. What did you say? Batman Here Laughs has about 200 and something thousand. Yeah, yeah. For that, that means yeah. there's about 200,000 people in the country buying comic books. Yeah. At the most, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, I mean, obviously there are more than that. I'm not saying every single person bought it, but that's a general yeah. look at what the number one and number two book are. That's about how many people there are mm -hmm. buying comics. Well, I also heard a thing, again, this is like an older thing with uh, Ed Pisker, you know, who does Hip Hop Family Tree and X Men mm -hmm. Grand Design, talking about like he doesn't know how many people are reading his X-Men Grand Design book because of the variant covers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He said he goes to cons, they bring him all the variants, so it's like, one guy's got ten books. Yeah, I didn't uh, I didn't so, want to go into a variant yeah, rabbit hole, but yeah, that's right. what I'm thinking with Batman Who Laughs was, yeah, that's the I thing say 200,000 because 200,000 people, 200,000 unique people did not buy that book. No, yeah, yeah, that's correct. That's yeah. the right. thing. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe you could be generous. Like, look, I buy, but I, I buy variants, and I didn't get a Batman these, Who Laughs. These sales numbers, they can't be to end users. These are... These sales numbers have two, to two retailers. Yeah. Two retailers. These, these are two retailers. retailers. So, what percentage of those books are still on the shelf? See, that's yeah, the other yeah, thing yeah. that's right. a killer. That, and again, you know that's why I, mean? I say it can't really the, be more than that because yeah. that's what retailers assumed yeah. would be a sellable amount. So, even if you assume that a lot of people aren't buying Batman Who Laughs, mm -hmm. it, it's still a good, you know, like round figure mm -hmm. to say mm -hmm. that's about what a top selling book is. I wish we had something like the way the Ultimates used to be back in the day where right. every single person that came in that week bought the Ultimates. It didn't matter what they bought. Uh -huh. There isn't really a book like right. that right now. Yeah. And again, on a previous episode where we were kind of going more in depth on the Walmart books, the numbers I was kind of trying to figure out was kind of based on Comicron too. And I think the Walmart books are a higher end of that. 
uh-huh. too, where you're dealing with like the kind of top five numbers there that you know we're oh, seeing on okay. a monthly basis in the industry. Right. So I think they're probably up there with mm-hmm. that. Yeah, I mean the story from uh, I don't remember where I read it was that basically Walmart was selling enough of these even after returns that they didn't really care about the exclusivity anymore. Yeah. They were like, yeah, it's fine, sell them somewhere else if you want. I don't care. <laughs> but they took a look at you know what a, what a reasonable yeah. ship to a comic store was, and right. it isn't like DC was saying, can I sell these at Target too? Mm-hmm. Somewhere where it's going to be the same amount of customers. It was mm-hmm. like, oh no, it's fine. We don't care. Do what you want. <laughs> All right, so is that what we want to say about that? I mean, again, just wild conjecture, but it is I'm good. Still, I'm still reading a ton of DC books, yeah. so there's also yeah. that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm still reading a ton of everything, so yeah, yeah I'm reading a ton of DC books. <laughs> All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about here is uh, let's look at the, the next comic, or the most recent uh, comics-related property to be bought up and produced and now actually dropped onto Netflix, which is uh, Dark Horse's... Um, Umbrella Academy by Gerard Way and Gabriel Ba, an adaptation. That's the original comic book and the comic creators, you know, that's been ad- adapted into a 10-episode uh, series on Netflix that we have all viewed at this point, yes. I assume. Yeah, so, it all. again, spoilers ahead, mm-hmm. you know. Oh, cool. I was going to ask. Yeah. How much spoilers? All right. the way. Because yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. I have less to say if we can't have yeah. spoilers. Yeah. 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 Well, I guess, but, I guess the first question for me is, like, I have not read any of mm-hmm. the Umbrella Academy books. Right. How, how much of those have, have you read? I've read some. Not. I don't think I've read a whole arc, you know what I mean? But I, I read two or three issues of the first, and I haven't read any of the second. I've arc. read uh, I've read all of the first trade. I have read – I don't remember if I finished the second or not. But we will say um, – because, well, if I'm ever on this again, it will become really apparent. I don't mind the spoilers. <laughs> so I, I spoiled all that for myself before I watched the show because I wanted to know what was in – the second mini so i know what happens in the second mini mm-hmm. um so effectively i've read the second one too and right. i've been reading the current one too mm-hmm. uh, so. i don't listen to my chemical romance and i have not read any of these comics oh yeah <laughs> fair enough <laughs> well i can't speak to the music because it's not really in my style <laughs> yeah. but the comics are great and yeah. the, gerard way and gabriel bob both <coughs> served as uh, showrunners mm-hmm. well not showrunners they, they they had like um producer credits and stuff right they were involved in the production of the show let's say so it it holds pretty true to the spirit they really Mm -hmm. dialed down the weird factor you know what i mean really yeah Yeah, they did (laughs) yeah 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 believe it so as i was saying before we started Uh in the the mini uh, the first mini begins with the children versions of the Umbrella Academy mm-hmm. fighting the reanimated corpse of Gustav Eiffel in Paris because he has come back from the dead to execute his master plan for the Eiffel Tower, which is to turn it into a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> and uh, basically eight-year-olds fight a zombie and an animated version of the Eiffel Tower. Right. And uh, yeah, so and the other thing, too, is you start off with the, the Netflix series starts off and you get... The girl giving birth, you know, in like the in like gym class or whatever mm-hmm. it was, you know, the pool, like yeah. that in the pool, yeah, yeah. whatever it was, and so it's just like they get into the whole backstory of like, okay, on this certain time, mm-hmm. on this certain day, forty three women who weren't pregnant previously morning, pregnant, you mm-hmm. know, yeah. gave, gave birth, birth at exactly the same time, and all these kids were born, and they all had special abilities, but this was the event, you know, yeah. whatever they called it, but. The weirdness that I'm talking about, you know, in addition to what Matt was talking about, is the event in the comic book was the finishing move of this cosmic wrestling match. Oh, yeah. Yeah, between the space that. squid. Oh, so at the point, it went the one combatant in the wrestling match. And we're talking in a ring, you know, just like wrestling. <laughs> and this big, huge guy jumps down on this space squid and knocks him out. That's what created these kids. Okay. So there's mm. that. In, yeah. in the comics, the yeah. uh, number one who has the giant gorilla body uh-huh. is his head is grafted onto not a gorilla, a Martian gorilla. Yes. Uh-huh. And that's never explained that's what never... exactly a Martian gorilla is. Right. And that's like what I like so much uh-huh. about the comics. It reminded me a lot of early Hellboy where yes. Mignola just throws random mm-hmm. things out. Is, and then maybe later he like, recaptures them, but maybe he mm-hmm. like never mentions that again. And mm-hmm. you wonder, what what was that? <laughs> what were you talking yeah. about? And uh, it's just, this, the Umbrella Academy is exactly BPRD Hellboy mashed together with Dark X-Men is what it yeah. basically amounts See, to. See, I, I would describe it as X-Men meets Twin Peaks. 
Yeah, which is fair <laughs> just, enough. Yeah, too. Uh, just I'm on Wikipedia. Characters. I'm uh-huh. on Wikipedia right now because I remembered that issue one had a really great title. Because when I opened it, I was like, "Oh, I'm going to like this." Issue one title is "The Day the Eiffel Tower Went Berserk." Yeah, <laughs> which is so great. Yeah, it reminded so, me a lot, honestly, when I first read it of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen uh, Volume yeah. One, because Volume One had the little standalone stories for a while. And I remember when I first read it, thinking, "Is this all it's going to be? It's just going to be standalone every time? Mm-hmm. This is awesome." Mm-hmm. And then I really liked it when there was an overarching plot, but those. Mm-hmm. First right. couple of issues, which was just like, what Victorian crap are we going to fight right. this time? Yeah. I don't know, but I'm really excited yeah. to find out. And I believe too, you know, like one of the things they changed too is the academy are never in costume. They yeah. don't have code names, which they do in the books. Yeah. Yeah. There's oh. Space they, Boy. Yeah, they do mention Space, Space Boy. Boy. They talk about that's his name. Yeah. That's his code name in the book. Yeah, that's and then me, like Uncle Space Boy. Kraken is Diego, yeah. and the horror is Ben, the guy with the tentacles. Yep. Yeah. You know, uh, the, so they all have rumor is she, Allison. Yep, she's, yep. she's mm-hmm. the rumor. White uh, violin is White violin. Yeah, yep. they even bring and, that out in the finale of it mm-hmm. you know her wearing the white suit and everything so yeah so it, it dials down a lot of that stuff it's very that, that stuff always sticks with me you know if we get a superhero adaptation and they're not in costume yeah it either reeks of budget mm-hmm. or we don't you know we're not going to do this jokey nonsense this is serious but i did like that when they showed the flashbacks they did wear the, they wore the dominoes and masks. the school yeah. kids outfits mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And the other thing they didn't bring out or even mention or is not even a thing in the books is, and even Hargreaves was, a, it was called the Monocle. Yeah. And he's an alien. And, yeah, he was going to say he's an alien. Yeah. I kept yeah. waiting for them to say that he I was know. an alien. That's yeah. why he's so mean. He's uh, not, he's, he's not, not people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so that's why he's so distant. So I was worried when they, when I realized they weren't going to talk about the Monocle being an alien, I thought, oh, are they going to say that Grace is a robot? And then they do. And it's, yeah, you know, right. a plot point. I was like, oh, good. I'm I got so to give props one thing that where they give budget was. Um, yeah. Pogo looked really yeah. good, yeah. you know. But I he mean? was just—he was just there. It's yeah. like, they never explained why he was there. Yeah. He's yeah. just—he's just there. <laughs> and the same serum that mm-hmm. created Pogo, was which I thought like, was a nice. If you're not going to do Martian gorilla, yeah, okay. may they as gave well him the serum, the same thing, and that's how he got the hairy yep. body. Okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, anyway. Pogo looked good, but I feel like that's one of the things that had to look good. Oh yeah, like, that would have stood. He's in there too much to look bad, you know. So as far as story, did you guys enjoy it? Or I thought it started kind of slow. Mm-hmm. And like, and if this, if this had not been a series that was based on a comic book, I don't know if I would have stuck it out. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was I was going to watch it no matter what. Plus, I knew we were going to talk about it for the show, so right. the podcast. So I had to, I'm obligated to watch it. But I'm glad I did. After uh-huh. a few episodes, I mean, you know, you kind of know that you know Ellen Page's character; she's going to have powers sure. by the end of this, and yeah. you, you you know, kind of know she's going to be the bad. But yeah, you I mean, you kind of you start. Well, I didn't know. I didn't really know that. So like. It wasn't, it well, wasn't obvious. I, I thought maybe she could come so save much. the day or something. But yeah. we don't we don't actually get that. Right. Um, right. So it was nice to not have you know very telegraphed storytelling like mm-hmm. like we got an Aquaman. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I got to get that dig in there just once. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so a new requisite that we have yes. to rag on Aquaman, Aquaman at yeah. least yeah. once. So, and and honestly, <laughs> honestly, we're just selling it short by only doing it once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but but I was glad I stuck with it because uh, then by the end I was a whole lot more interested and I am now looking forward to the yeah. second season. Yeah. So I thought it really got better as it moved mm-hmm. along, and yeah, I, I would agree. And I I told Dan, I'm like, man, I'm enjoying it, but I'm having trouble staying awake through a whole episode. You know what I mean? Because it's just like I don't know if it's because I'm old, you know, and tired or what. You know, as Dan says, you're just getting old. Right? But I would watch it, and the next thing you know, I'm I wake up and then I'll have to roll it back and start that episode. Those again. are some yeah. fun dreams. I bet you were having. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <that's> like, oh, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Did I dream that, or is that really happening? right? You know. <laughs> yeah, and again, I'm not familiar with the source material, uh-huh. but I feel like I did like it better when it was called the Dark Phoenix Saga. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, because that's obviously what Vanya is. I yeah. mean, and we had Syndrome. You know, was the kid that got rejected by the mm-hmm. Umbrella yeah. Academy. That's actually one of the gripes I was going to bring up. Yeah. I, I, so where I thought that I, I that it lagged a little was in the middle, mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. this is going to be spoilers for both the comics and the show. So in the comics. Vanya gets her powers and everything through through a, a group that has a piece of music that, if played properly, will destroy the world. And it's called and the they, Apocalypse it's, Suite. It's called the Apocalypse Suite, and that's mm-hmm. what the trade the, fir- the trade of the first story is called. And they basically go to Vanya as like, "You should play this music and take revenge on your family. They're jerks." <laughs> and and so it's. There's like a like a, a, a death cult basically wants to play classical music and destroy the world. And I thought that was better than this guy who's just transparently skeezy, mm-hmm. right? Uh, like uh, I know yeah. they try repeatedly to make you feel like you've judged him harshly, mm-hmm. but then 
immediately after any time you generate sympathy, they're like, oh, by the way, he's totally still a bad guy. You were right. <laughs> yeah. You know, when, when there's the thing like, oh, he loses his eye, and you're like, oh, man, I was wrong. He's a good guy. And five minutes later, someone reveals, he totally paid us to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they spent so much time with everybody, with Allison trying to convince Vanya that he was crap, mm -hmm. and then they do, and then she kills him. <laughs> and I was like, wow, we spent a lot of time to watching him be that. skeezy mm -hmm. as a, is he or isn't he a bad guy? You know, right. but spoiler, he totally is, and you're totally right. It's not a great reveal when you're like, oh, the guy you thought was a bad guy yeah, is a bad yeah, guy. Right. He's everything you thought he was. So I didn't love that, um, and I also didn't love, because I like the flashback set from the comics, I really wanted a lot more of the kid stuff. However, yeah. again, spoilers, based on the way the, the this season ends, it seems like that's going to be saved for the season two. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know, this season mashes together the plots of volume one and volume two of the trade. Cha-Cha, Hazel, and Agnes, all of that plot line is all from volume two. Um, all the stuff about... Um, uh, the boy, all the stuff about the boy, which that actually is what they just call him, the right? Boy. The boy, um, whose name, number whose five. real name, number five. Oh, yeah, was like his actual name. I can't remember now, but they, I know, I know him as the boy. Mm -hmm. The stuff about the boy being an assassin in time <laughs> is in volume two. two. Mm -hmm. uh, volume two is called Dallas, Dallas. and if you know oh, that he was an assassin. Boy. It's not together. the name of a guy named Dallas. Dallas. Um, so, <laughs> but, uh, so all that stuff is in Volume 2. And I remember thinking, like, well, why do we mash these two things together? You left out so much good stuff from mm -hmm. Volume 1. Well, it seems like the good stuff from Volume 1, like the day the tower went berserk, is just being saved for two. Yeah. Season two. Well, maybe through five. So I'm, I'm, I'm totally okay. I felt a lot better about the season mm -hmm. at the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. Once I got to the end, I saw what was going to happen. I was like, oh, I get why you made these cuts. I judged mm -hmm. it too early. Yeah. Here's you something else I was just cut side thing. I was wondering about watching the show. So Klaus is always in contact with Ben, their uh, dead brother. Are the others aware that Klaus is always talking to him? No. Because it doesn't seem like it comes up no. until he can Which interact with the physical because world. Which that's his power. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you would think he, he would bring that up like, oh, by the way, guys, don't feel as bad. Ben's, Ben's right, right here. here with us. Yeah. So you it's know. actually all of us together again because yeah. he's here. So you would, you would think that, you know, because Klaus, for the, you know, his his name in the comics is Seance, right. so he can talk to dead people. He can communicate with dead people. So they have a brother that they don't really get to into the you know the circumstances. Of I don't his think death. they even do in the comics either. Oh yeah, I can, yeah, I, don't I don't remember. I don't think they do. Yeah, <laughs> but um, but I mean casting I thought was great. I yeah. thought it was really yeah. spot on. I thought it was well acted. You know what I mean? They're very little known people yeah. to me. I know the Colin only... Fior was Reginald Hargreaves, yeah. which is. I think he played the main frost giant in Thor 1. You know, he was under a ton of makeup. You oh, know, man. I think he was he... in some action movie in the 80s I love because I know that name and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> right. and I, it seems like it was a... The, the guy who played number one is Billy Bones from Black Flag. Okay. Or, uh, Black Sales. Black Sales. If you haven't seen Black Sales, which okay. I love Black Sales. And, of course, Ellen Page. Ellen yeah. Page that's what I said. The only other person that's really notable yeah. is really her. Well, yeah. Mary J. Blige. Oh, yeah. Was, uh, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, that's Cha-Cha. Cha-Cha. Yeah. 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 I was just thinking yeah. about just the actual Yeah, character. yeah, yeah, yeah. But and Hazel, I know Hazel from yeah. Mindhunter. He, you know, what was he? Was it something else he was in? Damn. No, I was going to bring that up because we were talking about that the other day. Yeah, here. <laughs> yeah, but I really, I you know, that was some of the most enjoyable stuff to me was the Hazel and Cha Cha stuff. I really yeah, liked. Yeah. I really yeah. thought that was, that was good. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I felt like the movie was, or the maybe the show was really like populated by a whole lot of that guys, uh -huh. where you see somebody yeah. and oh. you think. That guy. What was that guy? He was in that movie, and you go to IMDb, and you're like, right, that yeah. guy. Oh, he was and in. Klaus. I never. I don't know him from anything. He just always looked like a Franco to me. You know, I was like, is that Dave Franco? No, no, it's not. I, I think we looked on IMDb, and we had seen not everyone, but uh -huh. most of them in, in something. something. But I mean, it was really kind of a credit to the to the styling of the show yeah. and the acting they did that I did not immediately, other than the number one, we were, we were like Billy Bones. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like nothing but face all the time, right? Um, every almost every one of those people, it's I couldn't really have identified where I'd seen it before. The only person that I could have identified would have been Ellen Page, and I wouldn't yeah. know. Yeah, if I would have other, remembered, other Page. I wouldn't know if I would have remembered her name. I said I know her from yeah, something. Juno. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's just <laughs> so you'd be like, that's Juno. Juno. Yeah. But I, I appreciate the fact that they didn't go get the flavor of the month actor yeah. or actress and, yeah. and or a bunch put of this Game together. Of Thrones actors. Well, that's right. where I was going. I just didn't want to get. I get a second Aquaman dig. All right, so there's number two for the evening, but. 
but yeah, um, that's what I was glad. I, I felt like I would rather mm. see people I don't know yeah. be bad than people I do know be but, bad, yeah. but but I, they weren't bad. <laughs> yeah, but it, yeah. it's just like it was solid all the way through, mm-hmm. plotting at points, drug out a little bit in the middle, like you said, a little confusing up front. I feel like it should have been eight but episodes then, instead yeah. of ten. But those last two to three episodes, yeah, man, they were yeah. dynamite. I really mm-hmm. thought, yeah. you know, and I love, love, love the way they ended it. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And that's that's another thing. This is If you are the type of person, and I think we all know them, that has to have every single little bit of everything explained to you and tied neatly in a bow, this show is not no. for you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because there's a lot of loose threads that, or stuff that's just... There's a monkey yeah. butler. Yeah. You know why? what I mean? It's just a talking monkey <laughs> yeah, why? butler. Why? Because monkey butler, <laughs> that's <laughs> why. Monkeys fighting robots. Or whatever, you know. <laughs> is what we need. So. I mean, they don't ever explain how how Diego's powers work at all. Right, yeah. At yeah. one point, my wife, who watched the show with me and loved it, mm-hmm. said, so what's Diego's power? Uh-huh. And I said, he's a badass. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, what else? And I said, well, I don't really remember. I actually said, I said, basically, he was like their Batman. He was just really tough and he was really good at curve, fighting and that can that's curve, what he did can yeah. curve knives she was like can he curve knives? knives and i said no but it doesn't really strike me as dumb i don't remember specifically it being like a knife curving power right. but <laughs> it also didn't strike me as being wrong either. and his like, code name in the books is kraken, the kraken. does that even explain i don't know you know <laughs> <laughs> but i mean there's release there is, the kraken yeah there is a lot of stuff that we don't know it's like okay we don't know well of course in the comics you, you explain how the event that yeah. occurred but where are the other what 36 yeah, people who were like born that day yeah, yeah all 40 yeah so where are that, the rest of them? That was I mean, the first thing my wife asked me was, do yeah. we know where all of them are? And I said, nope. Yeah. She, I said, well, I should say, you know, in the comics, I don't yeah. think you're going to in this show unless yeah. it's veered way off. Yeah. And then it turned out, no, you don't. And, yeah. and, and that's all he could basically, Cargreaves travel around, all he could buy. Yeah, I was saying, he yeah. says, yeah. these are the ones kids. I could buy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so he's a great guy. And these, oh, kids, okay. these kids are obviously messed up. You know it's also I mean? just really I mean, interesting that this dropped basically the same day as the DCU Doom Patrol uh-huh. show drop, which because yeah. they have kind of the same grumpy old man runs our team and he's you know kind of mean spirited kind of thing he started nah nah, nah. (laughs) anyway so do we want to rate this oh uh, I had to think of it go ahead everybody else Uh, I'd I'd give it a fine plus you know is what I do it's not you know not it's up against a very fine, but fine plus. Just due to some plotting you know just a little felt a little stretched out you know I give it a very fine. I think it's like I give it like an eight point oh. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, I yeah, think good. I think there's like I said, there's a couple episodes that maybe should have been trimmed a little bit, mm-hmm. but I feel like maybe Netflix said we want a ten episode season, yeah. and That's they were like, 13. well. You know, you know yeah, yeah, for, for sure. Every Marvel. I, I would yeah. always rather something end a little too early <laughs> and run a little too long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. the same way, and I felt that way with with. I mean, I loved Daredevil on Netflix, mm-hmm. but every season I thought. Eh, well, mm-hmm. probably could, and I, I thought it was really good. But I, I couldn't get enough Daredevil, less. so they, they could have had. Oh you know, yeah, I, mean, I still, I still enjoy season, it, but there's all, all, there was level. always an episode every season where I think nothing really happened. This one, like <laughs> yeah. you just needed to fill a series order here. That's why we have this one. <laughs> um, you'd always have at least one or two where it didn't really feel like the the big plot really moved. It was just cool stuff happened, and that's fine. It's a good enough reason to have a show. But uh, with with Umbrella Academy, which I feel like I don't know what you guys did. I know Mike didn't, but we fairly marathoned it. Uh, watch it over two nights and episode maybe six and seven. I mean, when you marathon, you kind of forget which ones were yeah. which one. Uh, but maybe six and seven were the ones where I thought felt a little pad up. Other than that, really happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had to marathon it so I could get it watched in time. So I'm <laughs> definitely slacking on it. Uh, but yeah, I'd I go, got my homework. Yeah, I'd go. I'd go very fine with it. Again, I'm not. Yeah, I have no connection to the source oh, yeah. material. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was it was better than I thought it would be. Mm-hmm. You know, I did I wouldn't have watched it if we weren't doing this. I right. feel like your opinion but, on this really weighs much more than mine does because I was absolutely in the bag for it already. I like the yeah. comics, so if you just gave me a half competent adaptation right. of comics, I was probably and be I mean happy. the thing the thing for me is too. It's just like once I was done, I was like, man, there's a lot of comparisons drawn to X Men here, and I'm really surprised they did that. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like someone didn't say, hey, let's change it up a little bit. Mm-hmm. more you know i mean it is it's its own thing but there's so many parallels you can draw there's the, there's this old rule in storytelling that people uh, i think ed burbaker is the person i first saw it uh say it but it's the, if you don't know what to do you just rip off red harvest uh, and red harvest is a dashel hammett story it, it got turned into um a fistful of dollars it got turned into that bruce willis movie last man standing right. it's been ripped off so many times that and the reason you can do it is that it's been ripped off so many times that no one can even point their finger at what you're ripping off right. it's just sort of a standard plot at this point well, and yeah. School 
yeah, full, you, of, school you, full of gifted yeah, people can, yeah, has been stolen can, so many times. Yeah, what's you Harry, can, what's you Harry Potter oh, except yeah, X-Men with right. wands, it's, man? Yeah. Uh-huh. Like, school full of gifted people has been stolen so many times. Well, yeah, we all know it's X-Men. It's it's not like you're the first person to rip right. off X-Men. Yeah, so yeah. you kind of, like, don't really feel that bad about it. It's pretty direct. Yeah, it definitely is. But, I mean, again, Especially, like you Dan said, Dark Phoenix Saga. Like, they made Kitty Pride Jean Grey. Yeah. <laughs> you know awesome. what I mean? I hadn't you know, even thought of that. Look, look, man. <laughs> they they didn't they didn't defeat anybody with the power of friendship or love, <laughs> which is all I ever ask out of a comic story. Please don't defeat them with the power of love. Yeah. And nobody said use all of our powers at once, hit him with all we've got. These are my rules for stories. That's why I hated X Men Apocalypse. Uh, but both things happen in X Men Apocalypse, right? There's, there's more reasons to hate X Men Apocalypse. Yeah, but like, like yeah. The, the final turn on yes. your Sunday was they used all their powers and then used the power of love. Neither of those things happened. So they stole a lot, but they didn't use the two biggest. Outs. Mm-hmm. I think I'm gonna go find plus two. It, it started less than that, but mm-hmm. it got pulled up as yeah. we progressed through the progressed through. And I I ended up watching like once or twice, like two or three episodes in a, at a single city, and as opposed to just like mm-hmm. one at a time. So I was I was getting pulled into it as we got closer to the end. Right. So. It does kind of pick early, up speed. Those as you early, yeah. 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 about halfway through is where I was struggling. That once it mm-hmm. hit that, probably those last three episodes. I think I watched them all at one night. Yeah. You know? <laughs> when you so. said the last three, that uh, that really triggered uh, the memory on me too because we we had stayed up late. Ish, mm-hmm. but not like crazy late and we watched eight and and my wife was like we'll just get up through eight and then we'll have two to go tomorrow and i thought yeah right because <laughs> i knew i was fairly certain we were about to pick up steam but we got to the end of the eight and i just looked at her and she goes well we gotta watch the other two don't we? <laughs> like, well, yeah as long as you're okay with it i'm okay with it like let's make some coffee and finish this right, right. oh goodness so, all right, so okay, we got yeah. all ratings on that, so uh-huh. I think we can all pretty strongly recommend that. Hopefully you will enjoy it and concur. If not, come in and talk to us about it. Tell us what you didn't like. Uh, okay, the last thing we want to do is keeping with what we did on our couple of podcasts mm-hmm. ago is recommend a Batman story since it is the 80th, 80th anniversary of... Uh, the Dark Knight's first appearance in Detective Comics number twenty-seven, and I believe it it should be out already by the by the time by the timeline of the release. But I think they're holding off Detective number one thousand until the twenty-seventh because that's cool. You know, it's right. Detective twenty-seven, mm-hmm. March twenty-seven. Oh, you know, okay. gonna put it yeah, out. gives them some more time yeah, to get yeah. everybody get their deadlines. Right. There you go. Get those extra few variants in <laughs> yeah, as well. Yeah, no don't do that. But <laughs> um, I am. I will be. I'm going to admit here. These guys know it already. But of all the topics we we discussed, I've got one I'm going to talk about. But um, I had forgotten about this, so didn't. So last minute, uh. I I pulled a box off the shelf. <laughs> look off the shelf. I know, right? And uh, so I'm going to wait and go last on mine. So Mike is that kids. kid faking a book report. I am. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, my book is. Yeah. And he's going to yeah. read the back of it. Too. I am that guy that skated through high school, you know, based on the backs of other people's success. That is me. So that's what I'm doing here, too. I break that. So, Scott, what's Okay, your... well, I'll go first. Well, I was not even aware of this story. I think Dan tweeted it because apparently Tom King – tweeted this because it's an eight page story of his that the entire thing is available online mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so all you got to do is go online and search for batman uh, good boy and you can see you can read all eight pages of this story it's all completely out there for free online but it's actually in a uh, batman annual number one and i it's just it's a nice story uh, it's really an alfred story if you get right mm-hmm. down to it i i think but uh um it's it's almost like a christmas story slash alfred story slash uh redemption type story but we have this dog that has basically been i don't know poisoned and made insane by uh, the joker and uh, over the course of this eight pages alfred is just basically you know nursing this dog back to normalcy and the whole time you know bruce wayne slash batman at various points i mean it actually starts with the dog attacking batman but he's saying that dog is a lost hope. Alfred's constantly told that this dog is a lost hope, that you should just put that dog down, you know, as, or even, and then uh, we get to the end and, and Bruce is like, he's in the room sitting with his dog and, and, you know, he's petting the dog and it happens to be Christmas. And, and then, uh, you know, Bruce is obviously enjoying having this dog around at this time. And, uh, um, uh, lost my train but oh he uh comments to alfred hey it's christmas and i know she didn't give me a gift this year so you know <laughs> alfred's like oh yeah i must have slipped my mind and, you know and then, and then as he's walking out he's under his breath world's greatest detective my why did she just read it instead of yeah because it's just it's just the punchline yeah 
world's greatest in detective indeed so basically yeah. alfred got him this dog as a gift uh, and cool. uh he doesn't even realize that's that that was the right. gift it's not um, it, well, is. it is. It is sort of, yeah. yeah, because because he's like all. There's these group of dogs. One of them's got an ace. One of them's got a king. One of them's got a, uh, a, a queen on it. You know, so so yeah. So it it is sort of ace. Gotcha. Um, and there's even a joke I think about it where he says, um, "What does he say? Yeah, do you want to be bat hound?" Oh, okay. So anyway, so reference. Yeah. Very so cool. this is. I mean, Tom King, his current run on Batman has just been, I guess, with the exception of Fifty, had yeah. just been amazing. <laughs> um, and this was just part of that yeah, run. Fifty. <laughs> and this is this is just part of that run in annual number one. It's just eight pages. If you don't want to pick up the annual, search for Batman Good Boy, and you yeah, can I think find it's free on Comicsology. It's, right? it, yeah. It, well, it's it, you you can find just, oh, just image online? shots. Yeah. Oh, wow. You just find image shots at a couple of different places. So. Um, but it's it's just it's just really really good. So. Scott, have you ever seen? And this will sound like a digression. I swear it's not. <laughs> have you ever seen the John Cusack movie High Fidelity <laughs> I about the record I, store? I have not. Okay, <laughs> so there's this part in the movie where John Cusack and Jack Black and this other character they work in the record store and they keep making top five lists all the time. It's what they do. Top five, blah blah blahs. And at one point when they're um, Jack Black brings in a new topic for the day and he gives the list out and John Cusack starts rolling his off and his first one. Jack Black says, "Oh my God, that's so good. That should have been mine. Uh, that's that's when you broke a good boy. I thought, oh, it's so good. That should have been mine. Why did I think of that? I'm stupid." So, uh, Dan, Dan, you want to go? Okay. Well, mine is from uh, World's Finest, number one fifty three, which uh, came out in nineteen sixty five. Uh, this is the saga of Superman versus Batman. You got that when you were 15, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it's got a really nice cover here of uh, Super of uh, Batman ghost riding on the bat plane's <laughs> wing, throwing a kryptonite batarang at Superman, oh. saying, "You fell into my trap, Superman. Revenge. How sweet it is." <laughs> Doing his best Jackie Gleason, I guess. Uh, One of this, these days, Superman. This, this is a hoax. Get this is a dream. This is an imaginary story. Uh, this is the cash. Clash of Cape and Clack Cowl, if I can talk tonight. I just like that Superman calls Batman my arch foe on yeah. the cover. <laughs> uh, that is harsh. So, this is drawn by legendary Superman artist Kurt Swan. Oh. Mm-hmm. And it is written by Edmund Hamilton. And in this, uh, Thomas, this goes back to uh, Bruce's childhood, where Thomas Wayne is a doctor trying to develop an anti kryptonite serum for Superboy. Uh, Superboy asks him for the serum and it's not ready yet so Thomas Wayne refuses later on Bruce Wayne goes into the lab and sees a blue red and yellow streak leaving the lab and his father dead on the floor (laughs) so he comes to the conclusion that Superboy wanted the serum and killed Thomas Wayne for it Bruce Wayne still becomes Batman but through a much different route (laughs) Uh, and they mention there's a sort of a side thing that Martha has already passed at some point so but he is an orphan. Which one? And did he yell his name? Yeah. Martha! So, oh, we it still, has the slap! We get to a different, you know, path for oh, Batman, but Bruce Wayne still becomes Batman. Yes. And you can hear everybody freaking out. This is the comic <laughs> where the infamous Batman slapping Robin oh, meme comes from. Oh, that's so awesome. Where oh, Robin gosh. learns that Batman's whole plan is to take down Superman. <laughs> and uh, says Superboy couldn't have killed someone. That never happened. Batman tells him he's wrong and slaps him in the what face. What five fingers say to the face? <laughs> right. Uh, oh my to the gosh. point where Robin turns against Batman at this point, and he uses Batman uses uh, a hypno- the hypnosis machine that he took from the crime doctor to erase Dick Grayson's memory and send him back to an orphanage. <laughs> oh, we all know Batman is cold blooded. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, as we learned in Mr. Miracle, Batman kills babies. <laughs> That's right. But apparently, he sends them to Orphanage. Uh, Batman oh then c- he drills a hole on the It's the, the Orphanage that gets me, right? Am I, am I, am I, I'm not the only one thinking that. He right. sends him to the Orphanage yeah. is the part that would put me over the top. Yeah. <laughs> Holy crap. So then Super- <laughs> Batman realizes that Superman must have the anti kryptonite serum at the Fortress of Solitude, but he doesn't know where the fortress is. Again, this isn't a continuity where their friends are have worked together. <laughs> uh, 
Batman uh, <laughs> drills a hole inside an empty water tower and uses a rifle, a real sci-fi looking rifle, to plant a tracker on Superman's cape as he flies by. <laughs> also, I want to note that there is a panel where Superman is flying in Batman's crosshairs, yeah. which is like the most Frank Miller thing. <laughs> right? And this is 65. Not Frank, Frank Miller. Years not Garth, Garth Ennis. <laughs> yeah. Edmund Hamilton. Yeah. Uh, and so then eventually Batman's able to put together God. where the fortress is in the meantime luther and his, his gang rob a bank through a very <laughs> convoluted like, you're means. a jerk batman <laughs> and for helping him stop luther's gang superman gives him a gift of a utility belt that will help him fly thereby empowering the man who's trying to kill him <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, oh. part two death of a hero uh. Batman teams up with Lex Luthor after he breaks into the fortress and steals the anti-kryptonite serum. <laughs> and they both uh, decide to take down Superman. Uh, they get him in a... You know, this is like halfway the plot of Batman vs. Superman. I'm just putting this out there. <laughs> Batman, quite dumb, works with, Super, works with Lex Luthor. Right. Wow. Uh, they end up getting him in a... Uh, what is it? Like a kryptonite bath or something like that? Sure. Oh, it's a case filled with kryptonite dust. <laughs> <laughs> and then has. Luther yeah. mentioned <laughs> Luther though mentions the anti kryptonite serum and Batman's like, I never told you about that. So he finds out after all this time Luther had a robot superboy <laughs> that he used to break into Thomas Wayne's lab <laughs> and because Luther couldn't control the remote control well enough, it accidentally killed Thomas Wayne. Uh. And so that is what Bru young Bruce Wayne saw leaving the lab. And so Batman realizes <laughs> his mistake breaks out Superman from the trap, but Luther shoots him with a uh, Z-Ray, a Z-Ray, which fells Batman, and uh, Batman pays for his uh, mistake with his life. Wow. And wow. poor Robin is left and in the orphanage. Batman's dead. About him. Batman's vengeance has killed him. Oh, Breaking God. Bad style. My cheeks are hurting because oh, I'm amazing. laughing and smiling so big. To, I, Holy I, smokes. I'm glad I don't have to follow him. I know. <laughs> I was just being polite let him go around the horn. I should have been like, let me tell you about my modern <laughs> comic real right. quickly. What issue is that? That is, one, that is 153 of World's 153. Finest. 153. I gotta get that. I believe oh, this, oh my this was reprinted in uh, DC did a couple collections of imaginary stories a few years ago. I think this is oh. in the second volume of that. Wow! Uh, oh, again, it's fu it's it's always fun seeing Kurt Swan draw Batman. It happened now and then, but again, not as much as he did Superman. Uh -huh. um, again, Kryptonite Batarang. I don't know if they've done that since. Right. And it's like, why not? It seems like the most obvious thing. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so like if you go to eBay right? and you type "world's <laughs> finest" in, uh -huh. the fourth result. It's the First specific single issue is World's Finest 153. <laughs> oh, so wow. that bodes real well for us, yeah. Scott. Yeah. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're screwed gonna, on the ice uh, on that um, one. Yeah. Gum, it's oh, you know what? Marion. Not as bad as huh? you think. The bookstore oh, okay. Marion. Book blah, 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 blah. Oh, the book exchange? Yeah, yeah. it was a book exchange. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. so that's where I that's picked where this up. It was a book exchange oh, yeah, back okay. in the day. R.I.P. To be honest, there are only a handful of copies on eBay. But you can get one for... Uh, a VG copy for forty bucks, yeah. so not like awful. Undoable. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. Totally, it, like, totally it, worth it. it, it yeah, yeah. yeah. Come on, you get the slap. Dan, the Dan's, slap. Yeah, Dan's copy looks slap. nicer than this one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll just buy this one. <laughs> oh, swap right? I enjoyed that. <laughs> that right. was great. <laughs> Kudos, Dan. Yes, Kudos, yes, sir. A plus plus. Yeah. Uh, well, that's it for us. We're wrap it up. George Cassandra style. That's all for me. On a high note. We're not beating that. See you later. Well, all right. Mike Mike is still uh, trying to do his homework, so I guess no, I'll, huh? I'll follow on. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay with my book report joke. Okay, okay. <laughs> Frantically trying to read your book before it's your turn. No, uh, if, it was, if it was told in true to form, I'd be stealing your report. Yeah. yeah. Taking credit for it. I also read the same book as Matt um, and what he said. Yeah. Let me so go first. I no. waffled real hard. I almost went with Long Halloween because it is... Uh, uh, the comic Amazing. story that, that got me back into reading Batman comics when mm -hmm. I was when I was first getting back into comics, 
uh, Dennis recommended it when I came in on a slow day before I worked for him came in on a slow day and was picking up a couple of books and Dennis asked me if I'd read it and he cut me like a deeper discount to get me to buy it which is about the most Dennis thing you can imagine <laughs> yeah. um, I'll, I'll give you I'll sell it to you for this buy it it's really good and he's like then we can talk about it next week and if you don't so, like it bring it back yeah that's what he said he's like you don't know, like it bring it back <laughs> I was like well I'm sure I will but I, I didn't do that one uh, I haven't read it in years so I don't feel like I can talk about it as well so then I waffled back and forth between two things in the, the modern Batman run one, uh, which is really similar to Scott's, I guess, but Batman Annual 3, the one that just came out not too long ago, uh, is a Father's Day issue about Batman and Alfred. And as somebody who is uh, or is and has uh, raised two kids that aren't mine, um, so I have two nephews that are effectively our kids, uh, and man, I'm not joking. And my voice is not cracking because I'm getting upset. I, it's really <laughs> cold. Because I will say, when I read it, I did get a little choked up at the end. And that's not what's happening now because I'd cop to it if it was. Um, but I did. Like, it got me a little bit yeah. that, uh, that you know, uh, Batman basically acknowledges that, that Alfred is his dad. Uh, no, I guess I'm. Uh, but, uh, but I'm not going to go with that. My, my all time favorite Batman story uh, is Tom King's Super Friends, which was in 36 and 37, Batman 36 and 37. And those are better known known as the double date issues where Batman and Catwoman uh, go on a double date with Superman and Lois Lane and uh, it's just it's full of just fantastic panels and uh, there's a lot of sight gags in it um, and I'm a huge Tom King fan anyway I'm, I'm like absolutely in the tank for that guy for anything he puts out uh, my wife laughed one time and said if you were a woman you'd have that man's babies um, <laughs> because I, I met Tom King in person and I have fanboyed out for I, I've met a good chunk of my comic book bucket list um, but I think I fanboyed out harder for Tom King than anybody else because he was just such a relatable dude anyway but um, I love his run because I think he treats super Superheroes, uh, both. So what I love about superheroes is that they're fairly ridiculous, and I like when people really lean into how ridiculous the concept of a superhero is. And I buy a lot of superhero comics, but I appreciate the sort of self-awareness of how silly this sometimes is. And he treats things really, really human. And I like that it's a really fallible Batman. I mean, how many times have we all read basically a Batman story where he's perfect and he's smart, and every time he has a plan and he always wins? And I think and he Tom wins because he's Batman, right? He's because ba because yeah. Batman wins is the plot thing. And and ba uh, Tom King's Batman is you know super smart and super super tough but uh but doesn't have all the answers he gets stood up at the altar he didn't see that one coming you know um but that that issue uh really plays with the medium too like i said there's there's literal sight gags like like a movie in it um you've probably seen some of the panels there's the uh the part where it, what ended up happening is they want to go to a state fair uh, Batman and Superman are both trying to get into get some evidence uh, about uh, some criminals and they end up running into each other they don't realize they're working the same case and they happen to have their wives with them basically <laughs> Catwoman was with Batman and, and Lois was like nearby writing a story or something and they decide to go on a double date uh, and it's it's supposed to be you know in the Rebirth era Batman and Superman aren't best friends like they were in, in Dan's era uh, for <laughs> World's Finest mm -hmm. uh, so it's supposed to be like their work colleagues but they're not real close and so their wives <laughs> Their, their wife slash girlfriend so like says, let's go out. And Lois ends up suggesting they go to the state fair and they don't have like clothes to change into. Mm -hmm. So they uh, they suggest that they swap costumes mm -hmm. and that they go as like people in a Batman costume and mm -hmm. a Superman. And so there's this th these parasite gags where uh, Lois and uh, Catwoman are trading clothes. And at one point, one of them says, it stretches. And the other one says, well, it better. Because they're like trying to shimmy into each other's clothes. And then there's a bit where Batman and Superman are swapping and Superman looks over there's like a divider in between him and he looks over as Batman's putting the suit on and points and says the S stands for hope and then Batman <laughs> leans over and he says the bat stands for a bat uh, and it's just like so then there's a part where they're in the tunnel of love and, uh, oh, and they're in the tunnel of love and, and there's like several panels with no dialogue of Superman and Lois holding hands and sitting side by side mm -hmm. and then there's several panels of Catwoman is astride Batman like furiously making out with him they're like in the boat behind and uh and, and all the time like they're in the other people's costumes so it, it isn't like it's like batman is sitting side by side with catwoman you know very chaste but that's not really batman and uh and it ends with uh with the answer to the question not can superman uh, beat flash in a race but can batman 
hit Superman's pitch. Uh-huh. Um, they go to, uh, and it's got that, like, you know, you're only human, Batman, and he's like, throw the ball. <laughs> uh, so they, it ends with, with him like, knocking a homer off of Superman. And it's especially given, you know, Scott uh, ragging on Batman 50, how that all turned out. Um, but it's, it's it, especially given all of that, it's just a really cool look. I, I love a Batman Catwoman romance, man. I still, I will die on this hill. I think they end up together at the end of Tom King's run. I, I, I really hope I'm not going to have to come back and retract that. I want to say, yes, I knew they'd get together. <laughs> so I think a Batman Catwoman romance is perfect. It's my favorite part of Batman the Animated Series. Um, it's the best part of Batman Returns. Um, it's just such a great banter back and forth between the two. Um, you know, you can love Peter Parker and, and Mary Jane all you want, but it's really hard oh, yeah. to beat the, uh, well, like, <laughs> for those of us who weren't alive. Uh, yeah, I wasn't either, but right. I still right. pick Lynn. I mean, like, <laughs> she's, look, Mary Jane was married to Peter Parker the entire time I read comics. Uh, so um, I love Gwen Stacy, too, but it's, it's really like, it's like saying I love Barry Allen, too. Yeah. Like, really, I, it's, it's, it's in hindsight. Mm. It's appreciation of something else. Uh, but it's just it's such a fun arc, and uh, my wife, does not share my appreciation for Tom King on this level. She she likes it just fine. She's not a big superhero comic person. And I made her read Super Friends, and she goes, oh, I get why you like these so much. <laughs> it's just really fun uh, banter. It's just it's just a really great two issues. If, if you were giving it to somebody who didn't even care about reading superhero comics, it's just a really cool look at, at four great characters and, mm-hmm. and just a lot of uh, real well-written dialogue. And that whole Tom King run really is is super. And there's another story that's kind of related to that where it's like set in, in the future after they've been mm-hmm. married for a while. That's Annual too. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay. And where basically we have a, a, yeah. a, a cancer. A, yeah, or, or <laughs> Alzheimer's. I thought Alzheimer's. Oh, I thought Because uh, uh, he was losing his memory. He's basically coming back and revisiting. Somebody being, saying that it was supposed to be cancer. But it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I thought he had a brain tumor. Okay, well, maybe it doesn't matter. Either, yeah. either way. But either way, he's losing his memory. Yeah. yeah, obviously. So it's, and it's just, it's another one of those things like that story was so good. Yeah. That's another reason why I was so disappointed in number 50. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I, but, it's, yeah, it's but, also part of the reason I'm so sure that they end yeah, together. I mean, um, and you're you know, probably right. And if you don't, if you don't know, there's a pet theory that all of Tom King's story is. Well, I should, I should stop for a second. So if you read Grant Morrison's New X Men way back when, Grant Morrison's New X Men was essentially a retelling of the John Byrne and Chris Claremont years. Like he did basically everything was in it. There was in Days of Future Past. There was mm-hmm. a Dark Phoenix saga. It was, it was essentially a retelling of all that stuff. There's a pet theory that. Tom King's run is a retelling of other Batman stories. That this is all essentially just Nightfall because it's about Batman and Bane, and about Bane is building Batman up to be broken back down. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, like I think it'll end up having a nice happy ending yeah. here because Nightfall has a happy ending too. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Mike, well, I guess up. that comes to me. Thanks for installing so I can read my book. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, actually, I just reached over here to the rack right to my right here and just grabbed a story on here that I'd read that I think I could remember. So um, the one I've chosen <laughs> with a gra- after great, great thought is uh, Alan Moore written and Brian Ballin illustrated The Killing Joke. This tends to be one of the books that even uh, in my you know experience the batman stories that people that aren't comics readers are aware of mm-hmm. you know they see, people seem to know about this story um again alan moore wrote it and according to him he seeds in all his craziness that this is probably he agrees with the assessment that the art in this book you know is better than this story you know he he agrees to that and part of that is just due to the fact that we get a whole book of Brian Ball and Art. Yeah. You know what I mean? Normally just get a cover. Yeah, you yeah. get any more. When's the last time you got a full book? I know. Of them? Yeah. And it's not a huge book. You know, it's a one shot thing. You know, it's just. 48 was pages, it, maybe? Yeah, maybe mm-hmm. something like that. Was it an Elseworlds? No, it ended no, up being no, canon, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Alan yeah. Moore claims that it was never his intent for this to, to be, be in canon. continuity. Right. Mm-hmm. But I don't. But did Elseworlds, like, not exist? The Elseworlds then? weren't really around yet because Gotham they, by Gaslight had Yeah, they created for Gotham by Gaslight, but I couldn't remember where they all felt. the story so directly. Exactly. There's yeah. no way this isn't continuity. Yeah. No, so, it is, but like yeah. Moore claimed that it wasn't. Oh, yeah, he didn't no. know he was writing Barbara right. Gordon to be paralyzed. Right, right. He just thought he was getting to write. Like He pitched write it allegedly as a joke. Like uh-huh. They said, what would it take for you to be a, a write a Batman story? And he said, let me cripple Barbara Gordon. Mm. And uh, I think Archie Goodwin, supposedly the editor, put the phone down, mm. came back, and then, well, there's profanity in it, so I've already yeah. cursed <laughs> once on this episode. I'd rather not again. Oh, but, but allegedly, according to Alan Moore's story, is that the phone got picked back up and he heard cripple the
bitch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> which was really harsh. But he said at that point he felt that he had to do it because mm-hmm. he had just, like, he didn't want to write a Batman story. And right. he thought if he threw out something outrageous, like, let me and paralyze Barbara, down. that mm-hmm. they would be like, well, no. And mm-hmm. then he would be able to soft pedal something else he wanted to do. And they did it. And he was like, well, no, I guess I have to. Right. <laughs> Well, the upshot of the story, for those that haven't read it or aren't familiar with it, is it's really the Joker is crazy. We all know that. Mm-hmm. But he becomes he takes on this personal mission basically to prove that the, basically the only difference between himself and pretty much anybody is one bad day. You know, And so what we get about this story that I'm not in this story that I'm not particularly fond of, and it has proven to not be the definitive one, is that we get an origin story of sorts of the joker you know before we know it's just like he was the red hood he fell in the chemicals it drove him crazy because it changed him all this and all that but it gets deeper into that whole thing whereas the joker was a stand-up comedian who had a wife and a young was pregnant with a child and all this stuff and through some freak accident of a bottle warmer i think she got electrocuted or it burned up or something like his wife died so that's what and then dealing with all this grief he's forced by this gang to put on the costume of the red hood where everything else took place after that you know so it drove him nuts so he kidnaps commissioner gordon after the act that matt just talked about of you know knocking on barbara gordon's door you know shooting her she you know she ends up in the wheelchair becoming oracle you know through dc Mm -hmm. continuity and uh he grab he kidnaps commissioner gordon takes him to this broken down amusement park and basically tries tries to drive him insane joker setting ever right yeah Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and just plot him in there makes him watch look at pictures of barbara being laying on the floor bleeding and and it's famous for like the you know this is from what like 86 or something yeah something like that it's famous for the really heavy implication of sexual assault yes Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. never directly saying Mm -hmm. but you know for for both him and the commissioner that like Mm -hmm. there's all kind of implications of what Mm -hmm. has happened to both of them but it's 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 really that's that's really well done right like Uh you can't i remember reading this as a kid and and thinking yeah thinking am i supposed to take away (laughs) yeah but they're like thinking this is a batman story so probably not but Mm -hmm. i think maybe i'm supposed to think that might have been what happened yeah but anyway things don't go according to the joker's plan you know i mean james gordon comes out of it obviously distraught but not insane Mm -hmm. batman apprehends the joker and all this stuff and the one thing that never 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 occurred to me that's kind of become a thing lately is just like people there are people that firmly believe that in those last pages batman killed the joker i'm one of those people do you think Mm -hmm. so yeah Yeah. i think that was the intent yeah, the you think that was story. intent? They kind of backpedaled on that. Well, Is that what you think? Well, because they, because they, they have the laugh, the laugh, the laugh, and, and then the, dead, dead silence. Dead silence, yeah. right? Yeah. They had also talked about putting a snap in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. and Alan Moore said they they wanted to leave it out to leave it ambiguous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I will tell you what I think. Uh, I think that you're not wrong, Scott. <laughs> but I think that the reason that that was. You can't have that be canon mm-hmm. and Barbara being right. paralyzed right. be exactly. canon. Yeah. Exactly. You have to yes. pick. Yes. Yes. So yeah. it's because, yeah. you know what I mean? Like So they backpedaled on that fight because they wanted Barbara, yeah. which with New 52 to is weird anyway, because all she of a got sudden better. she's walking around. Right? Yeah. yeah, and that was, that was how they addressed really it. Really I got better. better. Yeah, it was the, it was the, <laughs> yeah. it was the Monty Python. I got better. better. Like, yeah. Yeah. And it, the thing that never made sense, with it's a digression for another day, but it never made sense that Batman got his back broken and they <laughs> fixed it and right. there's all these people in the dc universe that can fix this and yeah. I, don't, I, I appreciate the dc kept it that way as for representation purposes i think mm-hmm. that's really great and i think it's a great story about how barbara isn't a disability barbara's a hero regardless mm-hmm. of, right. of, of what she can or can't right. do i think it's great but it doesn't like pass the smell test of the logic of the universe yeah. right yeah. Yeah. like yeah. everyone's like well that sucks for you barbara yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> everybody else coming back from the dead and barbara's <laughs> stuck in the chair you know it, well, this came up during Morrison's JLA run, too. Did it? Yeah, yeah. I think it was probably around World War Three, where she's in a suit and up jumping around and fighting and stuff, and I think Cyborg brings it up to her, and she refuses. Mm. You know, so they did address it now and then. Huh. But yeah, long term, though, yeah, it doesn't make you know, sense. Like the second the that she's, the second that somebody world. finds out Barbara Gordon got, Batgirl got shot, yeah. somebody's not going to, they're not going to give her the chance to decide this is her choice. They're yeah. just oh, going to swoop yeah. in and be like, don't sweat it. We, how, how quick, we got this. How At quick, least we can do. Yeah. How quick did Roy Harper get a robot arm? Right. <laughs> he kicked drugs faster than she kicked a wheelchair. Yeah. So, like, I I, I want to I just want to tag on. I don't I don't want to say anything about this issue other than the fact that after you read Batman Killing Joke, you need to find Brave and the Bold issue thirty three. I believe it's written by J. Michael Straczynski, 
and it is a very appropriate follow-up issue to that story. It's got Wonder Woman, uh, Barbara Gordon, and uh, Zatanna in that, and it is one of the it is one of the best comic books that I have ever read in my entire life. Hmm. But read The Killing Joke and then read that book. And that's all what I'm going to say. What was that number again? 33. It is actually fairly expensive to find, uh, to actually get. I think it has been reprinted, though. Um, but, yeah, uh, it's in a trade this someplace. Is, that's the most recent Brave and Bold series. Yes, right? yeah, so yeah, gotcha. yeah, yeah. The more, yeah, the more, yeah, the not the original. traded yeah. one character to the next. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It started with Mark Wade. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. Okay. Yes, yeah. But it's, you read that and mm-hmm. then read Brave and the Bold 33. Gotcha. So this is also, Mike, to speak to your point earlier about um, – it being one version of his origin, I think that I don't think they've ever actually said officially, but the three Jokers that Jeff Johns and mm-hmm. uh, Jason Fabak, uh, Jason Fabok are doing, I'm pretty sure is going to deal with that. You know, like that yes. is one of the three Jokers. Uh-huh. So probably it is an origin. Uh-huh. It's just not you know. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I mean, at least I they didn't. They didn't give him a jo- name, as yeah. I recall. No, right. I mean, no, it's just no, this nameless yeah. stand-up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, this struggling comedian. And I, I always wondered too. Like this, I want to say it was '88. This came out. Mm-hmm. But again, like they knew the Batman movie is right around the corner, yeah. so that they were going to do an origin That's for true. Joker either way. Right. Yeah. You know. Right. So I feel like they probably had to come up with something more substantial before mm-hmm. the movie broke. Yes. Yeah. And is, we're about to get another one probably here towards yeah. the end of the right. year with uh, with Joaquin Phoenix. So this is funny, Scott. Uh, it's not as bad as I thought it'd be. I'm looking on eBay for Brave and the Bold 33, but there is a run that says Brave and the Bold 1 through, thir- one through 35, missing 33. 33. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can get it, but Trust me, I'm just it's amused. A, it is a pricey book. Yeah, uh, nice. nice. There's, 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 uh, yeah. No, I've, I've got one. I mean, I got lucky and found one. It looks yeah. like it looks like it's about 20 bucks. Okay, yeah. well, that's not it's as bad. A, it's actually yeah. gone down then because yeah. it used to be for a while as a 30, 40, 50 dollar oh, yeah. book. Yeah. Here's a here's a whole run for 75. Okay, um, the slab there's, one. There's good stuff in that. Right oh yeah, too. yeah. So, it was a good book. Yeah. yeah, here's here's a buy enough for 25. So it's not. I mean, still, it's a lot of money for a yeah. single modern issue. For yeah, not yeah. as bad. Not as bad as could be though. No, yeah. But I think, like I said, I think you can get the trades. You can you can pick up the trade here at. You know, we could come in, talk to Mike, mm-hmm. order the trade for. I said, get both, get mm-hmm. Killing Joke, and then get that Batman or Brave and the Bold trade. Oh, it's Cliff Chang art too. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, he drew the Azrael Wonder Woman for mm-hmm. quite a bit, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. So anyway, so that is. I mean, it, it's definitely worth reading. It's not a groundbreaking or anything, but like I said, it's one of those that kind of seems to be. It was ground. It was considered. Psych- it, was it was. Considered. It was. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, again, if you get it for nothing else than those bits and the Brian Bolandar, you're just not going to go wrong. Yeah. It's amazing. And the joke about the flashlight. That's oh what yeah, I was going to say the, the joke is legitimately <laughs> funny. Uh-huh. I yeah. love it. I used to tell that joke in class I when know. I was a teacher. <laughs> yeah. I used to give credit. It's from a Batman comic, mm-hmm. right? It's yeah. also, you know, out of all of those things that are sort of stereotypical, what comic do you buy for people who've never read superhero comics mm-hmm. before? And people a lot of times say Watchmen, and those people are stupid, um, because Watchmen's really hard to understand. Yeah. If you're not a superhero uh, fan, like you miss a lot of it. Yeah, and sure. some people say Dark Knight Returns, and that's not bad, because it's a good Batman mm-hmm. story, but I think of the... This is of, the most accessible. Yeah, it, 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 it is exactly kind of what you think it is, and, mm-hmm. and it's more than what you think it is at the same mm-hmm. time. It's right. just a Batman Joker story, but it's way more literate and, and, and way more... Um, just thematically rich uh-huh. than you would expect if you were not a comic person. It right. is one of those great examples of comics. They aren't just for kids yeah. kind of right. things. And it really does. It has a mature story to tell that's not it's not inappropriate or uh-huh. anything, but it, it's it's shocking if you're not but, a long time. But it, you know, it does explore something. It's not explored, yeah. you know, you know, with that whole thing. And the whole concept of one bad day, you mm-hmm. know, can yeah. make or break a person, you know, and it's just this is an extreme version of that. And the resiliency of you know, obviously, the human spirit and all that stuff of Gordon being able to deal with what with that and keep it together. It comes out of it really quickly too. He does like, not right. bad. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. It's a great play. On and there's some really creepy little people. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's not, yeah. for, it's not for kids. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah, it's not a happy. How old, how old were you when you read it? Uh, <laughs> I was like, what year did it come out? Eleven or twelve. Yeah, I read. I read it in junior high. I didn't read it when it was new. Um, <clears throat> I picked it up oh. when I was way into Batman in like seventh and eighth grade. Yeah. Um, I, I, and I didn't know what I didn't know what it was, it, and it like I had like a fourth printing or something yeah, crazy like yeah. that. Um, and I just I remember reading it and thinking, "Holy crap, that's like yeah. fairly that's, intense." I think I was, a li- I was just a little older than that when yeah. I first read. I totally read Arkham <clears throat> Asylum when I was way too young for I it. I did yeah. not. <laughs> that one probably would have uh, had had some dreams yeah. maybe. Yeah, I, well, I pulled that off. I got bought that off the shelf at Campus Comics when it was right, up on yeah. the strip. 
Yeah, and I I'm trying trying to figure out how old I was because <laughs> um, 88. Okay, 88. so I I was 18. Right. You know, so yeah, it was. But still, uh, I mean, you know, I think if I'd read it at 18, I still would have been surprised by <laughs> by, by the fact like, that this was allowed in a in a Batman comic. I also remember buying Faust off the uh, off Faust, the shelf yeah, at because uh, <laughs> of the Tim Vigil art. <laughs> He was a hot guy at the time for the artist, not attractive hot, but <laughs> hot artist at the time. Yeah, so, yeah. Hey, you know, yeah, yeah, know. I don't, I don't, I don't even know what he looks like. So yeah. I've never yeah. actually seen a picture of the guy. So <laughs> it's, it, you know, last Maybe point about how great Killing Joke is is also a good play on what I think is one of the strongest things about Batman as a character, which is that his greatest um, villains are all basically backwards versions of him. Mm -hmm. And and this is a great play on that, right? Like, you know, we all know Batman is a result of one bad day and, and right. overcoming it. And this is you know, the 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 um, the irony in the story is that Joker can't know that this answer has already been, this question has already been answered by mm -hmm. Batman. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like all of the great characters, uh, his great villains are just, you know, Dark some play on his, himself. yeah, some play yeah. on his personality. Dark reflections of himself. How is the Superboy robot a reflection on. <laughs> well, I don't know, but I wouldn't have called him one of his great villains. Killed his father. Well, hang on. Give me <laughs> the next episode. I'll have an answer for how the Superboy robot. I'm gonna I'm gonna break my English degree out, and I'm gonna come up with some really pinkies Deep out, hoity-toity, <laughs> intersectional uh, <laughs> analysis God. of how this works. Uh, all right. Well, are we done here, we're gentlemen? We're done. I wrap it, so. put, yeah. a button, put a bow on it, as mm -hmm. they say. Well, hope you enjoyed this uh, rather rambling episode of Campus Comics Cast, but it's been a great time. Hope you've had as much fun listening as we've had talking. Don't know if that's possible, but we've had a really good time here. A good one. Um, They're all going to say, but, rightfully so, yeah. <laughs> Matt took this off topic. <laughs> and I'm going to say yes. Yes. And yes, we're okay with it. You, and we're fine with it. <laughs> Love it. But anyway, again, I hope you uh, enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions, you want to pick up some of these books, we keep try to keep these in stock as we... I don't know about Dan's because that's going to be a hard thing to find there, but we'll find something. <laughs> you with can it find in there. it on Imager and I find it in the relevant parts. Yeah. So, but uh, as we recommend these things, we make our best effort to keep these in stock. So if you want to come in and pick up a copy, um, you know, go ahead and do so here at the store at 816 B East Main Street in Carbondale, Illinois. Give us a call at 618-457-6011. Uh, follow us and like us on Facebook and Twitter, and that's about it. And on iTunes. And all on iTunes on the uh, for the podcast here, mm -hmm. all this or stuff. Anywhere, so, you anywhere. It's yeah. good for our SEO. Yep. So, uh, Scott, Scott Reed, BergComics.com, B U R G Comics.com, and uh, Mike hasn't mentioned this, and he should uh, that on you know, April sixth. Oh yes. Uh, he's going to Campus Comics will be at the SI Comic Con in Benton, Illinois. I unfortunately can't be there. I'm really disappointed. I want this is the first year for that show. Mm -hmm. um, I have a family commitment that weekend, so I will not be able to attend. Otherwise, family. I. Uh, this is your family. Comic yeah. books are your family. <laughs> my, my, my brother is getting married, so oh, I will well. be. I will have to attend that. Oh, wedding. Scott, half those Come in yours. Go to the con. <laughs> go, to, go to the next one. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was implying, Dan, and I took it to a real dark place. I appreciate that. Normally that's me, but I, I appreciate it was you. So, yeah, so you can, uh, you know, be sure and talk, uh, stop by and talk to Mike there yep. about submitting your yeah. CGC books. That's right. And, that's and right. all that good stuff. And then uh, come see me at the Dyersburg uh, Comic Con in, on March 16th in Dyersburg, uh, Tennessee. And then, of course, uh, we got the Metropolis uh, Superman Celebration. Yep. Um, occurring in June and and yeah so the check our websites and Facebook pages for this information about our is starting the up. cons and then well, you know SIU in September yeah. so I mean we're already scheduled out into September yeah there you go. And Dan Brown online at detective 651 and here at the store on Saturdays Matt Martin at Wookie Copilot on pretty much everything <laughs> so all right well thanks everybody it's been a been a good time and we'll talk to you later mm -hmm.